born at 49 Oak Street. That's the number that was on the front of the house. And uh, it was next door to my grandparents. And, uh, my, and my, it was the same number, though, because the house was in the backyard. I grew up here and I enjoyed the people. I felt close to all of them that uh, I could go to, to the grocery store and there would be people that would know me. We all knew each other and it was, uh, it was like a bond because we lived here and we supported the, each other. Almost everybody that lived in this neighborhood was of Finnish heritage. Uh, in fact, at one time, 8th Street was probably the most Finnish street in the United States. Ashtabula Harbor was so well known that uh, many people had relatives in Finland and when they sent them a letter they'd say Harbor USA and for some reason it would find its way to Ashtabula Harbor and uh, it's well known that uh, to the Finns maybe because of the migration that uh, here's where they were going and here's where they are. There was so much work to be done because at the time the work was being done with shovels and wheelbarrows and scoops and uh, they, were, they were taking the dirt out from, uh, they took Fort Hill down. Fort Hill was a hill that was at the end of the river and uh, it was almost as high as uh, the Point Park. And uh, they took that all down. What they did was they put the cribbing out into the lake and filled in with the dirt that was uh, on Fort Hill. My grandfather came first in 1888. And then a year later, he sent for my mother and my, for, my, and for his wife and my mother and my aunt. That we were, my mother was only around, about three or four years old at the time. And uh, in fact, because she had, he had been gone for a year, when she saw him again, she said he had a, must, he had a goatee. And, and she, she told my grandmother, she said, who's that bookie? The, 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 bo the bookie is a goat. <laughs> she saw the, the go goat whiskers. They were under Russia, and the, fin the Russians were very willing to sacrifice the Finns in any war or conflict. <laughs> so the men <laughs> were encouraged to leave, and they came in twos and threes, you know, like my, uh, my grandfather came with two brothers, and he was the youngest. He came in 1891, and he spoke English all because he became a businessman and very successful businessman. My grandmother came seven years later as a 21-year-old and could reside in this whole area without learning any English. What they used to do was uh, the families that came here, and once they had apartments, sometimes when new people would come from Finland, they would take them in uh, until they found a place for themselves. And uh, I, sometimes I wonder how they ever made room for them to, out, to sleep because there were so many of them that would come. But uh, my mother told me that when, when she was younger, she remembered that uh, they, they, the, when, the, when there would be girls coming, they would sleep sideways on the bed so that there was enough room for everybody. The docks was a lot of hard work. Um, he was gone sometimes for a couple days. The men slept on their shovels. They didn't have hot lunches. They carried lunch buckets to work. So it wasn't easy, but uh, yeah, they, they made it. <laughs> the willingness to work of the Finn migrants uh, to take on the more difficult jobs, such as shoveling coal in, in or, or, or in the boats to get it in the bucket and clean boats out. They, there was many Finns, many Finns worked the docks. They worked the roundhouse, they worked the uh, car shops that repaired the railroad cars. They were willing to stay hours and hours and work on the machinery, which in them days were uh, pretty primitive. And they kept 
uh, it took a lot of maintenance for these men to stay there in the cold, the wind, the rain. They would stay there and uh, get the job done and get the, uh, the product moving again, be it ore or coal. I think my grandfather at times would be a fisherman too. That he was kind of like a jack of all trades. He did a, he did all kinds of things, but he always had something do, going that he he would initiate a job if he didn't if it wasn't one there. So that uh, uh, I I think that's that's important for people to know that not everybody just came because they had a job waiting for them. They didn't. They had to look for things, and some of them created jobs like businesses. Alfred Humphrey built the house. He built it for to have, for the people that were coming in to work. And uh, my grandfather was one the first tenant in the house. I think they lived in the apartment upstairs. That was the first one that was finished. Then uh, he bought it because Humphrey Humphrey th said the taxes were too high on it, so he he didn't want he didn't like it. So he he sold it to my grandfather. Well, Fintown is the area east of Lake Avenue and starting with Bridge Street to 9th Street and incorporates uh, Joseph Avenue, Coyne Avenue, and all these streets. And that's where the traditional Finnish businesses were established and the two saunas and other activities. Four churches, three Lutheran churches, and one congregational church were in the area. At that time, you more or less uh, built your home in the area of your church. And uh, not very many people had cars, so they did a lot of walking. And, and here on this corner, they, oh, they had the uh, Finnish Congregational Church, was right on this corner. And my right next door was the parsonage for the uh, uh, Congressional Church, and I knew the pastor real well. He was there many years, called Pastor Haru. And uh, my mother was, uh, he had a regular radio program. My mother was a soloist on his uh, program, which didn't go over too well with some members of the uh, Finnish Lutheran Church. Well, I would say quite a few people did go to Bethany. That was a large church, uh huh? And uh, then there was Zion across the street that was Missouri Synod. So they were altogether different from us. And, uh, but Bethany was very large. There's uh, a great religious heritage uh, in the area. Um, even at Bethany Lutheran Church, there's a wall of uh, stones that were ordered by the pastor at the time when we were built, pastor's wife. The time that the church was being built, she thought it would be interesting to have a stone from different villages representing where the people had come to Ashtabula from. So they're all uh, placed in uh, on the side wall at Bethany Church where all these the Finnish people came to Ashtabula. Uh, their, their villages were, were represented. In, and the stones were sent to New York City, uh, and then from New York City, they were brought to Bethany, uh, to Ashtabula by train at no cost to either the folks in Finland or to the people at Bethany. Bethany Lutheran Church especially, they used to call it Big Church because it had so many people. They had, they had uh, a, a big enrollment that they was, it, was, it would be packed every Sunday. It was, there were so many people. 
and we were right near the church where we went to, Bethany Church. We were always obligated to go there for holidays and regularly. The family regularly attended church, which is different from families nowadays. We started a Sunday school together. We were confirmed together. And uh, I guess it just uh, took off from there. Actually, I grew up with my wife. We grew up together, and uh, actually, we were in school from uh, kindergarten on through 12th grade. And I'd been in the Navy two years, and I came home and uh, I decided we should get married because she was in Kansas City at the time, and and uh, she was drifting apart, and I didn't want to lose her. Uh, my grandfather was a deacon in the uh, Evangelical Finnish Lutheran Church on Joseph. And uh, uh, but then, as uh, during World War One, the World War Two was starting in over in Europe, uh, they sent for a Finnish minister to come here, and uh, the boat sunk and he died. So they they didn't come here, and they gave up on the church. People didn't have cars, so they walked to work. The ladies would have lilac bushes and different, they had flowers, they enjoyed the flowers. But then when they got cars, they'd have to put the driveways in and sometimes they'd have to take out the lilac bushes and things. And I remember when I, when I was younger, when the lilacs were in bloom, you could smell it in the whole neighborhood. It, it was not so nice. Oh, there, was, uh, there were grocery stores and uh, uh, <laughs> meat market, there was different, uh, they were, there, there was one on 9th Street, Mrs. Taino had a, a grocery store on 9th Street, so for that, for that, neighbor, for that area, and then Lampolis had it for, when I was a child uh, on, on this street, and then in the next block there was Hookery's. Mr. Hookery was, uh, he did uh, excavating work and road work, and uh, they used to have a saying, you know, when people would ask him how he was doing, he said, he'd always say, Kaiki mene cementin. I mean, everything going into the cement so that he wasn't making money. <laughs> That's the West A Street apartments, but during the uh, 1900s and to the late 1920s, that was the Finnish cooperative grocery store. And it was uh, probably one of the largest stores around. It had 17 employees, and uh, they had delivery service all over the county of produce and other goods. And they uh, sold every all kinds of items there. In fact, you could buy a new car there, order a new car there back in the 20s. <laughs> My grandfather happened to be the uh, uh, manager of the store for about 20 years. And this place was Rantala's store, a grocery store which was still in existence during the uh, uh, 40s and 50s. This is my old place. My bedroom was right up there. I could hear the traffic in the morning and we'd sit down here and, and my mother and father were great baseball fans. And we sat on the porch usually in the evening listening to Cleveland Indians games, uh, drinking Kool-Aid. <laughs> We live so low in the heart on A Street here that we remember the train whistles, the ship whistles, the tugs signaling the oar boats. Night after night after night you would hear the trains, the old steam trains pulling coal cars up out of the harbor and you would remember the whistles and the sound of the trains pulling that much weight out of They were tugging, using power to get strings of railroad cars up out of the harbor. 40s during World War II, uh, we could hear the, uh, uh, the Hewlett's running with iron ore Hewlett's, and you could hear coal cars being pushed up the tracks, and you could hear the uh, turnbuckles hitting, and that was the uh, blinking sound. And, and you could hear the whistles from the boats. Each boat had a signal as to uh, uh, if they needed tugs, they had a signal for that. 
If they wanted a lift bridge to go up, they had a signal for that. They used to wash the clothes and hang them up out in the yard. And they said they would get them down before the electric laundry started because the, uh, the, when they banked the fires at night, the, the wind would bring the smoke down over. So they'd have to get the clothes down before the, uh, the, they got the soot all over them. If the wind was wrong, if it was from the other way, you'd have to watch the car ferry. The car ferry would come in and that would, that would have soot too. <laughs> I grew up on West 9th Street, also known as Cherry Street. I was born in my grandmother's home, and uh, it was just uh, a great place to grow up. We played out in the streets because there wasn't that many cars. So you did your playing in the streets, you played, you did your playing in the dump. And I don't think that it was mentioned that the dump was a sunken dump. And uh, we had a lot of fun down there. We had swings down there. We we went sledding, and uh, it was just a fun place, like Disneyland. This was my dad. They used to do pony rides in the harbor. And this was just right out front down here on the sidewalk. Uh, the ponies would go around, and you could get rides. Mr. Kinnunen had a store, and uh, people would have, sometimes they'd run up bills, and if they couldn't pay them, uh, during, especially during the winter time, if they didn't have construction work, he would he would have them work on those houses. He had bought the lots, all seven lots on that Joseph Street there, on the uh, between Ninth and Tenth, and uh, he he built had those houses built, and then he rent, he rented them. If someone said they lived there, they'd say they lived in Kindles and Kaupunki. Unfortunately, the Finnish men did like to drink. However, there wasn't, wasn't fresh running water like we have today. Um, water was kind of scarce for the workers, so they would often drink uh, beer. Well, the temperance societies were started to combat some of the um, uh, alcoholism that was becoming rampant. Now, the uh, bar owners, many of whom were Finnish men, were upset because their customers were now becoming parts of temperance societies and were attending their bars. So they were losing business. So some of the men, and this was like the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, some of the men kind of did both to ple please their wives at home and yet their friends that owned the bars, they wanted to keep them in business. So they kind of tried to do both. Sometimes the Finnish bar owners would hire attractive young Finnish women to entice the men to come into the bars again. So the, the reason um, they built the Savinta Hall, one of the reasons, was because of the, the three Finnish uh, Lutheran churches I mentioned, they had disagreements on religious tones. So the Savinta Hall was built where everybody came in harmony. And also, it was also part of the temperance society that had to be formed. They were, there were a lot of temperance societies in those days because uh, there were a lot of bars uh, in Ashtabula, especially on Bridge Street. So Vento Hall in the 20s and 30s uh, was the largest wooden structure in the state of Ohio. It stood on this property, which would have 
but started near the sidewalk and run almost all the way to the back of the property, there would have been room for a small building in the back. It was a cultural center. It was a sports center. They had a sports team. They had wrestling here, basketball. They did theater arts here. They had artists uh, who painted here. They gave art lessons. Uh, and then uh, sometime later, when it was out of the hands of the Finns, it was uh, people uh, remember coming here to roller skate. So the wooden floor was still in pretty good use in the mid-50s, perhaps that was. Well, they used to have an annual ball for the shipmasters. For the, it was the shipmasters' ball uh, in the spring, just before the shipping season started. And they it would take them a month to get it all decorated because the ones that the Southern Hop people, uh, would, the SAC club would, they would decorate it up and they'd have a, they'd have a theme. They wouldn't let, tell, they didn't want to tell anybody else what the theme was. They, they would decorate with, a, with uh, ornaments and everything, and uh, they would, they, they would dress. The girls would wear formals, and they. Oh, well, I remember. I used to think, oh, I wish I was old enough to go to an annual ball. Then the war started, and, they, and I never got there. I was born too soon. <laughs> it was an interesting neighborhood. There was always something going on. And there, sometimes, if there was nothing else at the hall, they'd have lectures coming. Somebody that would be uh, lecturing about different things, and, and then they'd put on plays. At the far end of the large room was a stage and that's where they also performed. They, my aunt and uncle were caretakers of the Sovento, and their names were Hilda and Eldon Kane. And uh, they had four children, and they lived in three large rooms on the second floor. My cousin Bob often made fires on the outside of the building, and we kids would roast marshmallows. So can you imagine a fire going next to the, a wooden building? They danced the finished dances, and the, 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 my mother used to tell me that when she was younger, they used to dance at the, uh, in the hall across the uh, at the southern the hall, and uh, they uh, they weren't allowed to have the music on Sunday, so they'd have the the ring dances that they <laughs> they would sing, and she said, and my grandfather would tell her. You didn't go to church. I heard the music. <laughs> so, but they celebrated different uh, holidays, in like midsummer. They used to go out to out on Lake Road East. Uh, the uh, the Woodman Woodman Park, I think it was. They they would go there. They'd have a a, a big bonfire. They would burn their rubber tires so they would make a big fire. Oh, that was something. Uh, my great great grandparents moved here, and then I had great great uncles and aunts, and then my grandparents. So I would say I'm like a fifth generation. My uncle Eli lived here with his parents. My great grandma, great great grandma and grandpa Vithanen. She passed away before I got to know her, but I was probably about four when my great grandpa Vita Papa, that's what I called him, um, when he passed away, and my Uncle Eli lived here for years. Um, I remember when I was real little, all my great grandpa Vita Papa could say was yes and no. He'd say yo and a. But every time he saw me, he'd talk a little more fin. And I found, uh, my uncle gave me a, an old Victrola, 
that works. And there was a lot of records, and I found the actual record of the song he used to sing to me when I was real, real little. And I remember parts of it. I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but he'd sing it to me. On I'd sit on his lap, and he'd go, um, Hurra, hurra, hoit minulau, lena soit, and a malima malkin oil. Lena soit, then a lena soit, then a One interesting person I met was Ann Lundy, who lived around the corner, and she spoke broken Finn. She used to sit and tell this story about this ship, and she was a survivor of the Titanic, and her daughter would kind of interpret a little bit, but then she'd start to stop talking, and she'd get emotional, and she'd send us kids outside. Found out from my Aunt Vi that that's when, I guess, was in the midst of the people that were dying in the water. So she just couldn't talk anymore. I really loved her. She was such a wonderful lady. I'd also go to the Bethany Lutheran Church sometimes with my, my great aunts and Mrs. Lundy. And I'd sit there and play with some of the kids. And, and they all spoke Finn. Didn't understand really what they were saying. Some broken. I had always broken uh, Finnish because my grandparents lived right here next door. and. Uh, it was easy for them to t talk Finnish. My older brother knew the English because he was already in school, but uh, we, they still talked Finnish at home. And uh, when we moved out to Arlington, my mom said I didn't talk for about two weeks. I just I'd nod my head yes or no, but I wouldn't say anything. And she, could, she thought there was something wrong. And finally, one morning, my, she had made mo oatmeal, and I wanted some more. And I said, girl, say Mert. And, and uh, I, had, I was going to talk English, and from then on I talked English. I said, I, I knew that the other kids were saying other things, you know, talking differently, and I picked it up, and I, from, I, I didn't have any trouble in school, and I, you know, I had learned English. About 85% of the people were Finnish Americans, and all of them were probably born in the United States, with minor exception, a couple of grandparents lived with the, the families. And all of us grew up with, with uh, Finnish parents who were American born, who spoke Finnish, but it wasn't passed on to us. So when they wanted to uh, talk privately about something, they'd speak in Finnish so we didn't understand what they were talking about. My dad would say that we're Americans now. That he would not teach us even though they spoke and wrote fluid Finn. They would not teach us Finn. They could, uh, they would communicate amongst themselves in Finnish, but they would not teach us because my dad had a strong belief in that we were Americans now, we were going to live the American way, and we were going to respect this country. Next door were the Shannons. And uh, uh, they, their children lived in the house after they, after they passed away. And across the street was the Barretts. They were Irish, too. And they, were, they, they got along fine. The, 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 of course, they used to fight between themselves but sometimes. But uh, if someone else came into the neighborhood, they got together. <laughs> uh, well, they were going, putting in water lines that uh, Italians came then. Not most of them went back, but there were a few of them that stayed here, but they did have a community here then. And uh, they came to the uh, Mother of Sorrows Church until they built their own church over there in, in Three Tongue. Uh, we, were, we were conscious of being uh, Finns and uh, that we should have the pride in our heritage and Go be careful with your association with these Italians, which were across the river. <laughs> and the uh, grandparents would frown a little bit if they, you mentioned you were going out with a Finnish girl. And uh, it was even more for the girls. The girls, of course, were 
kind of told, hey, stay away from the <laughs> Italians. And then my, I asked my dad one time, uh, what did the family think when, when Grandpa brought Grandma over? Because Grandma was with the Italian family across the ridge and learned for years what that meant. And the Italians were across the bridge, the Finns were over here. But my dad always said that um, my family was very, he remembers the family just supporting each other. Um, they didn't frown upon it or uh, make my grandpa feel uh, bad in any way, and they embraced uh, my grandma, Amelia. So my dad used to always say, well, you're Finn and Italian, but he'd say, you're Findago. <laughs> so we would laugh about that. No, I did not feel different uh, because of the fact that there was a lot of Finns attended Washington Elementary, a lot of Finns attended Harbor High School, a lot of friends lived on Lower A Street, and we were friends with the majority of them. So uh, to, to, to feel that we were different or out of place, no, not by any means. I think we had a degree of pride that we in school, I think most of the most of us were good students. In fact, in my high school class, the uh, valedictorian was Victor Pondon and lived down the street. One street over was Jack Kangas. He was the salutatorian, and we had about seven of the first ten were uh, uh, Finnish uh, Americans. I was a fifth generation at Harbor High School, and um, had a lot of pride in that and all of us fi Finnish kids, we kind of stuck together. Um, there were the Kanguses and um, the Metlikas and um, the Hokanen. Actually, when they took out the Harbor dis District Schools, they took away a community. When the old folks died, they'd sell the houses, and the, the, folk, the younger people had probably built, built new houses out west in town, and uh, so they sold the grandparents' house. Some of them stayed, but most, of, a lot of them sold the houses, and especially if they moved, if the children moved out of town, and of course, especially after World War II, the, so many of the boys had been. Uh, in the service and they'd gone to other places and they went to work in other places where they they had thought they'd like them they would go there my father-in-law always kept saying you should move to edgewood because they've got the best school system we lived in uh, on south ridge east for 11 years and uh, we saw a nice home in kingsville on, on north right street and uh, that's where we bought our home from. We enjoy coming to the harbor, but I would never want to live at the harbor again. It's not like it was, uh-uh. The things my mother did and my aunts, the, the, one of those childhood smells, is the smell of baking Nisua. Nisua is a Finnish coffee bread made with cardamom. Cardamom is a spice from the East, India, I believe. And um, my mother made it uh, almost every week, at least twice a month, if not every week. Something we grew up with, something we enjoyed having. There were, uh, the same dough was used to make cinnamon rolls with the cinnamon filling in them. And I did, uh, after I was married, I did attempt to make it, but there is an, a technique, and I didn't make it very often, though my husband certainly did like it too. Now we make it at uh, Bethany Lutheran Church on a monthly basis, except for the summer months, selling about um, between 400 and 500 loaves, all pre-ordered, all purchased ahead of time. I've been, I've been helping for 20 years now, too. It's been 90, I think I started in 90, well, 95. Came down as a braider and 
man that was mixing at that time looked out there and said, the ladies don't need the help there. And he needed me and I ended up coming and helping him in the kitchen. Today I'll probably be about one o'clock before I get done. But we were back then we weren't doing as many batches either, but we get done mixing about eleven o'clock, but then I could go back out and I'd help braid and do the other run up and do other things. A time ago someone had to die before you were invited in. <laughs> it was a very, yeah. very elite group. Yeah. I don't like <laughs> when my manor died, she said to invite me, so I've been here for twenty-eight years now. Then I was punching down some of them. Well, my mother used to do it. I used to watch her, but I never really had to do it because she always did it. My mother said she thought it was really something when, because her mother, they lived on all homemade bread in Nisu, and she was so envious of the girls who had store-bought bread for their sandwiches in school. <laughs> yeah. Although my mother has said, well, she's passed away a long time ago, but she said what we make at the church tastes just like the Nisa her mother made. And on this day, this is where I am. This is where my family knows where I'm at. My uh, father's mother and father came from Finland in the uh, 1800s, or, you know, early early 1900s. My father was born in Ashtabula, and uh, I was born in San Diego, California, but came back to Ashtabula when my mother and father left San Diego after World War II. My mother was born in Finland and came to the United States with her family back in the uh, 20s. Uh, my father my father was working in the fish houses in Ashtabula Harbor uh, when he was 10 years old and because uh, his father died, my father's father died when my father was 10 so he went to work to help support the family he had uh, one sister and two brothers and uh, so that's how he got involved in it and so he was working in the fish houses basically cleaning up and dumping fish guts that kind of thing and then he started filleting the fish and he enjoyed it so later on in life when he was 50 he quit the railroad and opened up Hill Max Seafood Market in 1966 and I got out of the Navy in 1971 and in 1972 our family decided to open up a restaurant to help supplement the income from the fish market and it was another avenue that we could have the fresh fish at the fish market and we could have the fresh fish supplied to the restaurant so basically you need, you need both of them to make it work. I buy fish on Monday from the Boston area and uh, it comes by truck Monday night. It arrives here about 8 a.m. on Tuesday. That's a hell of a hell of a hell of a This is the biggest fish in the flounder family. Most flounders are only the size of this fish's tail. Just one separate. There's some 
red grouper from the Gulf of Mexico. Fresh sea scallops. This is one of these right here. I love swordfish. It's really good on the grill. Or blackened. And then you do that, you get careless. Now. Cat food. Yeah, that's good. He's a, he's a stray. We, we feed him. I just fed him a couple minutes ago, so now they're, now they're just visiting. Case these are really primo as far as oysters go. These things are really, really good. And voila. Same. Well, come on out of there. My breakfast. Look at that beautiful shell. Well, when you sell fish, you eat all this stuff because it's the best. I know it was. The Finnish population, there was an ethnic fish called Lipia Gala. And uh, we used to actually process and make it here back in the uh, early 70s. But that kind of went by the wayside. We don't sell that anymore at all. It's basically gone. Yep. A dried cod and you have to reconstitute it. It's kind of a lengthy process. You have to reconstitute it by soaking it in fresh water and then soaking it in lye water. And after you soak it into the lye water, you have to get the lye water out of it by soaking it in fresh water, changing the water twice a day. It's about a two week process. It actually tastes horrible, but it was, it was the fish of the day mainly because of preservation back in the old times. They had to do something so that it wouldn't spoil. There was no refrigeration. You had ice, but so they would dry it and then soak it and reconstitute it and boil it with onions and potatoes with a cream sauce. Pretty, uh, pretty potent stuff. I never, I never even realized that the, that the fish have a, a smell to them particularly because I mean you're around them all day long. But when you make a deposit at the bank, the uh, tellers can tell you that your money smells like fish. As a three or four year old, you were brought to the steam bath by your parents usually, or father usually. And then from then on, it was kind of a part of your life. For a lot of the older people, Saturday night was their night to, they went to the sauna. That was kind of a traditional part of their life. and. Uh, socializing also. You went in by yourself, some older Finn would grab you and scrub your back real hard and <laughs> they took care of you because the steam baths were a social organization for them as well as a place to get a bath. One of my best experiences, well unique experiences, was when I was 17 years old I worked summers on a section gang in a railroad which is a kind of a dirty job, you get creosote and, and coal dust and all that stuff on you. The first time I came home and went up and took a, sh took, a took a shower in the bathroom, my mother was horrified. She said, "You're never gonna, as long as you're working, you're not going back there again. You go." <laughs> so, whenever I quit after that, I'd get my quarter and go down to the steam bath here and use the, use the steam bath. I was banned from the bathroom during the summer. Sauna <laughs> is a Finnish heritage. You better believe it. Uh, I have a wood burning sauna at home, and uh, I use it every Wednesday. So it's, uh, and wood's the only way. There's electric, there's gas, and there's wood. Wood, wood is the only fuel for the sauna because it heats you three times. When you cut it, when you chop it, and when you burn it. My friend Dennis Jarvie's father, Arnold Jarvie, had a sauna off of his garage. And uh, I kind of went by the dimensions of his. And I or ordered the very same wood-burning sauna stove that he had in his which came from a place in Upper Peninsula, Michigan. 
And uh, I bought that stove in 1988, still working today. For sauna stones to transfer the heat from the flame, you, uh, you need granite. And uh, Lake Erie has plenty of granite rocks, boulders, all along the beach. Some areas have more than others. I got mine at Whitman's Creek, and uh, there were so many there that I was getting very particular about which ones I picked up, loading them into a five-gallon pail and walking them up the hill. That was the hardest part. Go inside, right? Yep. It's about 60, 60, 60 Celsius. <laughs> I used to have a bulldog, he'd come out here, but my bulldog's been long gone. So this is Daisy. She knows, she stays up here, she loves it. Like I said, in the wintertime, when it's a little bit chillier in here, I'll light that off and let the heat come in, put this fan on high, and it just blows the heat everywhere. Well, she'll go in there and jump up and down the benches, you know, and look out the window, but she won't go in there when it's hot. I'll open this up. Come after heat out here. There we go. Wood is the only way. You know, with gas or electric, you don't get that nice aroma either. A daisy. <laughs> yeah, sauna is like a, a relaxation kind of thing. Friends come over. Some friends have never done this. So I usually tell them, if you want to take a sauna, just, just bring your towels. I'll supply you some beer and whatnot. And, Go from there. Just bring your, you know, bring yourself two towels. One you can sit on because you get wet coming in and out, and then one you can shower up and dry off, and you don't want to use the same towel. So generally speaking, what they'll do when it gets warmed up and they get ready to go in, they'll take their clothes off and put the towel on and get ready to walk in. I go, what are you doing? So I'm going to go take a sauna. I said, do you take a shower with your clothes on? They go, no. I said, well, you don't take a sauna with a towel either. It's a naked deal. That's what it is. <laughs> Some people don't understand. They see too many movies, you know, that people are wrapped in sheets and stuff like that. When we were young kids, my mother, father, sister, and I, we'd all go together. Now, as you get older, you, you didn't do that anymore. Maybe in Finland they do. Uh, my uncle was in Finland many, many years ago visiting some family. And the... Uh, the daughter of his relatives had her boyfriend over and, you know, they were talking about my, my uncle could speak fluent Finnish. And after the conversation for a while, they said, okay, well, we're going to go take a sauna. So they went in together, boyfriend, girlfriend. Finland, it's a, it's kind of a no sex in a sauna thing. It's just something that you do. How many years ago we don't know, but they're the, they're the inventors of it. It's it's a ritual. It's a pleasant ritual. It's fun. The magic word is sisu, which means courage, stick to it, and willingness to 
proceed at all costs, and that's a unique Finnish word, and, and uh, Finns take pride in the fact that they and their grandparents had sisu, which enabled them to come to a country not knowing the language and not having any friends other than other Finns to survive and get a job and have a good way of life. Many of them thought of going back to Finland, but uh, most never returned. They stayed, stayed here in the U.S. and became uh, Americans. Oh. This is determination where you, you don't let things bother you too much. You go ahead and do it. You, you, don't, you don't wait for someone else to try to help you. You do it by yourself. You, you got, it's, it's determination. That's what it is. Oh, Sisu. Yeah, yeah that's, Finns have Sisu. That's, that's kind of an untranslatable term. I guess basically it's... Uh, have guts, stamina, something to that effect. My mother and father, when they opened this up in 1966, you know, they worked here day and night. And uh, if, if, you, if you want to be a success, you don't come in and punch a time clock and then go home a couple hours later. You have to, you have to stay in there and put it together. The bullheaded fin, don't give up. Just keep plugging away. I mean, it's, it has its up and downs, that's for sure. In, 19, in 1968, there was a huge mercury scare in Lake Erie and basically the only fish we sold were Lake Erie perch. I was in the Navy but my father said that he didn't sell a fish, one fish for the whole week. So he thought in two years, open, close. But we weathered that storm and we're still here today. I love being a Finnish American for the fact that the worth ethic filled in us, uh, the honesty, the hard work. Uh, I've worked probably 60 years. I've retired. I drove a truck for near 50 years. I always knew that it was a rough, a day's work, and that's it's why they call it a job. A day's work is a day's work. That was instilled in us at a young age. We had no problem with it. So a day's work was basically fun. It was just to pitch in. Do the extra. Do what other people weren't doing, and t tie in and get it done. And it it it, gave, it instilled in all of our my brothers and sisters uh, a strong strong work ethics and an honesty in working. If you didn't get the job done or you let somebody down, you felt ill yourself that you let somebody down. Fins get the job done. There were different uh, places where the widows and where some of them worked housework. They would take the streetcar uptown to to up to Bunker Hill and and some of the uh, in different places, and uh, they would do the house. They would do the housework, and uh, they, in fact, like Geneva on the Lake during the summertime, they used to advertise Finnish women wanted that they they were good workers, that they they could be they were dependable, that they liked them. So that uh, uh, they, they, they if they someone didn't do a good job, the other Finns would let them know that they they hadn't, that they wanted that they, they better keep it up. <laughs> fin to, Finns were rascals but you never known them to do major crimes, spend time in prison, that. Not, not, not in the harbor here, not in the harbor. They were workers, they were trying to make an honest living, and they were willing to make an honest living. And I'd like to see that carried on, and, 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 and the, the proudness of my dad for the ability to put in the hours and hours that he would work and work hard. i like to see that carried on. From Ashtabula, we had several uh, men that went on to be scientists that worked on the Manhattan Project. Um, many businesses have been started by Finns. Architects and artists have come from Ashtabula, the Ray Kosky, to name one, and uh, many of the buildings that are now standing uh, were designed by the architect, architectural firm of Kujula and Kosky. Um, the one I, I can think of offhand is the Bethany Lutheran Church was designed by them. They designed many homes, though, too. Were, had this uh, distinctive, almost uh, Frank Lloyd Wright influence to many of the homes that, that they designed. I feel very 
very proud of my Finnish heritage because of, I guess it's because of my great, great grandparents coming here and establishing themselves and my great, great cousins and um, just feeling them, just feeling, feeling them within me and um, knowing that a lot of other Finnish families had come here. It's just a part of pride and the struggles that they went through to get a better life. When I come across uh, a fellow Swamilainen, which is a fellow Finn, um, we just kind of like almost hug each other and we end up talking about the harbor and, and the Finns and uh, what's your name and what's your name and uh, it turns out that their, their families knew our family and we knew them and their families went to uh, the Bethany Lutheran and um, certain events and um, we like hug each other and and say huva paiva, you know, have a good day and it just makes you feel so proud. I'm, I'm proud of my ancestry as far as that goes. I, I, uh, I, I think of myself as an American, not as a Finnish American, but it, I, I'm proud of my ancestry.